We here at Abundant Life, we are what we would call an equipping church. This isn't some big show where you come to see a person and you get all hyped up and that's it. No, we believe that the Bay, which has 10 million people and only two to three percent are Christian, and naturally not all those 10 million people can fit in our church. What we've got to have are an army of people who come to our church who get what they need so that they can walk out into their society and all the spheres of their influence and be who God's called them to be. That's why our tagline here at Abundant Life is literally a better you for a better world. We make this promise. You hang in there with us. You'll be bettered, but not just so that you can be bettered, but you'll be bettered so that your neighbors can be bettered, your co-workers can be bettered, your families can be bettered, students in your classroom can be bettered. A better you for a better world. I think it's really great that um, everyone here is so diverse and comes from different backgrounds because I've never been to a church where um, there's so many different people all coming to unite for one thing and that's just really amazing to see. I joined a growth group a little over a year ago and I think it's been one of the uh, most life-changing things that has happened. Um, I went through a personally difficult time and just having basically a second family here in the Bay has been so necessary. I just I've loved them and they have just loved on me and um, just I felt the love of Jesus through them. I've been going to this church for a few years, and but was more of a consumer for a while, and now I'm, I'm really, really happy to be to say that I'm getting more involved and in being more of a contributor, uh, being involved with the worship team, and, and really trying to just contribute to, to this great community that we have here. Grace is something that, frankly, in, in my life, I've had a, a little bit of a hard time understanding. I think Pastor Brian has a book about that, that I've been working, working. Look at me, God, I, I need to do this, I need to do that to, in order to please you. But I am, I am pleasing to God because I am under his grace. And because I'm under his grace, then I want to be pleasing for him and serve him and honor him with my life. And be, having your flesh and, your, and live in the spirit, sometimes I still fall into that. But God's grace, I'm learning as I get older, is greater. And just resting and abiding in that is what it really is about being a Christian. Going is part of me. I have to go. Um, it, whether it's, you know, bringing something that I've learned to the youth group or whether it's going abroad, um, I think that we all need to respond to what God calls us to. And when we don't, I, I feel unsatisfied. You know, I feel like I'm not fulfilling what God has called me to do. And there's a discomfort there that I think is healthy. What I love about ALCF is that when we gather in worship, it's people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. You know, we'll go from playing a guitar, acoustic guitar with flip flops to one of our chocolate brothers playing the B3 Hammond organ, you know? I love that because after all, we're getting ready for heaven, right? That's what heaven's gonna be like. And so that's what our sound is and that's who we will continue to be. People who gather in worship from every nation and every tribe lifting up the name of Jesus. My prayer for Abundant Life is that we would become a house of prayer. Totally committed, totally submitted, and always seeking God's will, seeking his mind, and his way of life for us. This is ALCF. 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 ALCF. This is ALCF. This is Abundant Life. This is ALCF. Amen. 
thank you so very much. It's appropriate that uh, we would sing about Mary right before we hear from the Word because our focus in the Word of God is going to be on Mary. If you have your Bibles, please meet me in Luke chapter 1. If you didn't bring it, uh, don't worry about it. We're going to have, um, have the text on the screen for you. We're going to pick it up in verse 46 of Luke chapter 1. I want to also say thank you, Rejo and Caitlin. Wasn't that so, so good? what they had to share with us. Uh, I feel really nourished and encouraged. I almost feel like we don't even need a message. They preached. They, they absolutely preached. Haven't gotten to know Caitlin yet. My wife and I are looking forward to getting to know them. I've spent uh, several sessions with Rejo just hearing his heart. Uh, God is using him in great ways in the marketplace. Uh, he leads a Bible study at a very well-known tech company uh, in our world. And, uh, you know, we believe in something here called the priesthood of all believers. In other words, my job is to equip you for you to get what you need to shine as a light in your spheres of influence. Amen? All this is is a huddle. All this is is a huddle. You get what you need so you can represent Jesus. And I couldn't be more pleased with how God is using Rejo and his bride, Caitlin. Pick me up in verse 46 of Luke chapter 1. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Why? Verse 48, for he has looked upon the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months, and return to her home. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, would you speak to us? Uh, We Protestants, Lord God, uh, don't give Mary the attention that is due her, but ultimately why it's due her is not because of her. It's because of what you did for her and through her. So, Father God, would Would you speak to us through the incredible example of your servant Mary, a 12 to 14-year-old young girl, as we find her in our text, who has astounding faith and has a lot to teach us, even at this tender age. I pray for our youth, Lord God, who are maybe in the sanctuary right now or who will be streaming or listening later on. They are not the church of tomorrow, Mary teaches us. They are the church of today. They can live for you right now. 12, 13, 14, 8, whatever it may be, help us to remember our creator in the days of our youth. Now speak through me, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I hate waiting. Absolutely, positively, I hate waiting. If my wife were here, um, she, she would have been saying the loudest amen you have ever heard in your life. I was actually born early. <laughs> how much I hate waiting. I, I hate waiting on my food in restaurants. Uh, I hate waiting on delayed airplane flights. Uh, although if they tell us there's a mechanical issue, take your time. I want you to figure that out. Uh, I'm the dude in the grocery store uh, who once he's got his items, I'm doing my analytics as I survey the lines, trying to figure out which one's the quickest line. Anybody else like me? Don't I'm feeling a lot of judgment right now. Um, so uh, I'm trying to figure out what's the quickest line. Uh, after I do my analytics, I figure that bad boy out. I know for sure this is going to be the shortest line. And without fail, right, uh, the person right in front of me is the one, God bless her heart, who pulls out a bag full of coupons dating back to 1963. And it takes me forever. God has a sense of humor. I absolutely, positively hate waiting. Reason why my mama-in-law and I got on a, got off on a bad start is when I called her to ask her for permission, should have asked her for her blessing, I was going to do it anyways, but when I asked for permission to marry her daughter, she replied, let me think about it. 
I'm thinking in my mind that's not how that was playing out, but okay. Um, so I'm waiting on her to respond after two days of waiting in silence. Um, I don't hear nothing, so I went ahead and did it anyways. And we have since recovered, but it took about half a decade to repair that faux pas on my life. And of course, nothing tries the metal of my patience than Bay Area traffic. Lord have mercy. I hate Bay. I cannot tell you. I moved here from New York City. How many times I've been sitting uh, in the parking lot, also known as the 280, waiting to get to my house and just thinking about I'd rather be on the one train in New York City right now than sitting here. And, and what drives me nuts the most about Bay Area traffic is nine times out of ten when you finally get your breakthrough, and you're surveying going, well, what caused the delay? Nothing. <laughs> Anybody with me on that? It's one thing to wait. It's another thing to not have kind of any tangible reason as to why you are waiting. Drives me nuts. Makes me want to speak in tongues. We're in a season called Advent. Now, Advent, let me tell you what Advent is not. Advent is not um, uh, just trying to get you to a state of sentimental feelings and to get you caught up in the commercial, uh, commercialization of Christmas. Uh, that's not ultimately what Advent is about. Uh, Advent is looking at the first coming of Jesus, but even then, it's not just a history lesson. It's not just looking back at the fact that Jesus came. Uh, in fact, what Advent is supposed to do is we look back at his first coming as a down payment on his second coming. So what we Christians are, we are in a season, here it is, of waiting. We are caught in between first coming and second coming. And what Advent is supposed to do is, it is God saying, I want you to look back because for centuries the people of God were waiting on the Messiah to come and waiting and waiting and waiting and I've been prophesying and finally I fulfilled my word back then with a little baby boy wrapped in swaddling clothes and that is supposed to fill you with anxious expectation in which you say if God came through on his word once way back then he will do it again when he sends his son Jesus we shall behold him face to face. We are in a season of waiting, of waiting. And yet nothing is worse than not just waiting, but when there's silence to our waiting. Habakkuk says it this way, will you look at it with me, as he waits on God, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Why are you silent when the wicked man swallows up the one more righteous than he? Or hear the words of the prolific poet W.H. Auden who continues Habakkuk's thought. He writes, we are afraid of pain, but more afraid of silence. For no nightmare of hostile objects could be as terrible as this void. This speaking of silence, is the abomination. This is the wrath of God. What, what the prophet Habakkuk points to and what the prolific poet Auden kind of helps to buttress is, it's not just the waiting, but it's when I don't hear nothing. Ever been there? Ever been there? Some couples here today, and you've been waiting on God to open up that barren womb. You've been praying and praying and praying and praying and fasting and praying and fasting and praying and fasting and praying and, praying and nothing. Someone's here today, and your marriage is on life support. No, you haven't been the perfect spouse, but 
that you've been waiting for a breakthrough. Praying and praying and praying and confessing and repenting and doing what you can and nothing. Others of you have been waiting on that rebellious child to come back from the far country. and You've been on your knees seeking God, begging God to to show up and have a breakthrough in that child's life. And for months, for years, you've been praying and praying and praying and nothing but silence. Others of you have been in a season of unemployment. You're saying, God, I, I'm not asking you for a brand new Range Rover with the 26 inch rims. I, I'm just asking you to put food on my table. I'm, I'm asking you, God, for the bare necessities of life. Nothing. Someone else. You're in a health crisis. There's cancer. There's a debilitating disease. Praying and fasting and praying and fasting and praying and seeking God, shaking the gates of heaven. God, where are you? Tell me something. Show up. Nothing. Ever been there? Oh, if you haven't. Keep on inhaling and exhaling. And you will find yourself frustrated by the silence of God as you wait. But then it happens. Many of us have had this experience. I, I've been on many a road trip, cruising down the freeway, uh, going at the speed limit maybe five miles ahead of it because I believe in grace. And here I am cruising, cruising, cruising down the freeway. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, there's traffic, but, but this time I'm, I'm not flipping out. And the reason why I'm not flipping out is I, I see these little orange rectangular signs with, with little black words etched, etched across them that simply says, men at work. Now this blesses me, and this makes the weight more palpable. For two reasons. One, I understand there, there's a purpose to the delay. You, you've told me something. And, and two, it's more palpable because I understand that the reason behind the delay is actually for my benefit. You're taking what was broken. And you're fixing it up. You're taking rough places and you're smoothing it out. That's how I want you to view the prophets in the Old Testament. Here is Israel. She's been waiting and waiting and waiting. She's in captivity to yet another nation. She's in bondage. She's oppressed. And yet along the way, God sends his little orange rectangular signs in the form of prophets in which the prophets tell waiting Israel, hang in there. A Messiah is coming. A deliverer is coming. There's a purpose to it. It's going to work out for your good and for God's glory. God is coming. He's going going to show up. In other words, what they want them to know is, is that while you're waiting, God is working. His silence is, is, is not insensitivity. His silence is, in, is not inactivity. Just because you can't see him, just because you can't sense him, just because you can't feel him, just because you can't hear him does not mean God is not working. And I declare to you that same God is up to something in your life. Withhold judgment on the holy God. He sees you right where you are. He hears your groans. He hears your cries. His silence doesn't mean he doesn't care. His silence doesn't mean he's not up to something. In fact, the God I know tells me that while we wait, he's at work. 
that God never sleeps nor slumbers. He's working it out in your life. That's why I love what John Piper says. At any moment, God is up to 10,000 things in your life, and you at, at best may only be aware of three to four of them. He's working. All things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. But what do we do while we wait? What do we hold on to while we wait? We lay it now at our text. Uh, historically in church history, our text has been called the Magnificat. Ever wonder why that is? It's called that because the first word in the Latin translation, what's translated in English, magnifies. And the it's the first word in the Latin translation known as the Vulgate. It's Magnificat. This is a song in which, again, Mary, 12 to 14 years of age, she's pinned. She is responding to a conversation she's just had with her cousin Elizabeth. Elizabeth has blessed Mary upon the revelation that she is going to be the one to birth the Messiah. Here's Elizabeth. She is pronouncing good things on the life of Mary. And Mary responds to not only the blessing of Elizabeth, but she responds to the call of God on her life by pinning a song in which she is rejoicing. Again, why is she rejoicing? Back in chapter 1, verse 26, the angel Gabriel shows up to her, and the angel Gabriel says to her, you are blessed and highly favored. Why? Because God has chosen you to be the one who will birth the Messiah. And upon that revelation that she's been called on God, she rejoices. How, what do we do while we wait? Number one, we've got to rejoice in the fact that God is working through your call. That's right, Mary is not the only one in Scripture who has been called by God. If you are a child of God, created in the image of God, there's a call of God on your life. Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says it this way. Will you look at it with me? For the gifts, here it is, and calling, calling, calling of God are irrevocable. I'm here to tell you right now, God has a call on your life. I don't care about what your mom and daddy, the fact that may not have, they, they may not have planned on you being here. And one of the ways you know that is if your closest sibling is a decade older than you, you was a surprise, but you were not, you were not a surprise to God. You've been created on purpose and for a purpose. There's a call on your life. I, I don't. I don't care what curses have been spoken into your life. Maybe a stepfather said you won't ever amount to anything. Maybe an old boyfriend or an old girlfriend says you weren't worth anything. I'm here to tell you that is not the truth of God. That God has created you in his image. And the very fact that you are breathing today is proof positive that God has not given up on you. There's a call on your life. Someone here today, you're suicidal. This has been a rough year for you, and you're questioning whether or not you should even be in existence. I come against and I speak against every spirit of suicide in the name of Jesus. And I say you will live under the authority of God because God did not create any mess when he made you. There is a call on your life. And anything that runs contrary to that is from the very gates of hell, and we rebuke it in the name of Jesus. There's a call, there's a call, there's a call on your life. I want you to feel that. I don't care how much failure you've gone through. I don't care how much trauma there is in your life. I don't care how much hell you've gone through. God is not done with you yet. He's up to something. He's moving. He's at work in your life. There's a call. There's a call. There's a call on your life. But hear me, this is the un-American portion. Whenever God calls us, he always take us, takes us through an incubation period oftentimes filled with suffering. 
See, we, we rejoice in the call. We, we, we want the destination. We just don't want the journey. We, we, we want to get to where we're going quick, fast, and in a hurry. But if you would peruse God's kitchen, you will be surprised to discover that in God's kitchen there are no microwaves. Only crock pots. So God says, Brian, I've got a call on your life. My call is to get you here. You're here. I want to get you to a place of fall off the bone, succulent faith. <laughs> but you ain't ready yet. So I've got to put you in something you don't like. Put the lid on so you can't get out of it. You can't fix it. Your checkbook can't solve it. Your social network can't, can't get you out of it. The letters behind your name can't fix it. You're going to have to learn to lift up your eyes from which cometh your help, knowing that your help comes only from the Lord. And then I got to turn up the heat. Not on high. I got to slow cook you. So I just want you to understand. I, I, listen, th this is the normal pattern in Scripture. So if you read Genesis, God has a sense of humor. The very ones he comes to and says, you're going to be the ancestors, the patriarchs of my chosen people. I'm going to birth a nation through you. But you're going to have to go through a period of infertility. Or he comes to David, 1 Samuel 16. Do you know from the time David is anointed as king, call, to the time he actually sits on the throne, most scholars tell us 15 years go by. What is he doing in those 15 years? Running from Saul, dodging spears feigning madness in Gath, hiding out in caves, writing psalms of lament, wondering, God, where are you? Fifteen years! And for you, it's been 15 months, and you're freaking out. And then there's Mary. Pregnant out of wedlock. I mean, can you just man imagine the conversation? Hey, Joe, um, pregnant. <laughs> Joe's like, that's weird. We haven't had sex. Who's the daddy? <laughs> Sit down for this one. <laughs> it's the Holy Ghost. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, according to the law, she should have been stoned. Waiting suffering. I love red velvet cake, and that's my problem. My birthday is coming up on February 11th, so if you want to bless the pastor. Every now and then, I'll, I'll, I'll get an inkling to go to the store and make me one. Eggs, flour, sugar, butter. These items have a call. But these items just don't go straight into my stomach. They got to be beaten, battered, stirred up, shoved into an oven, door closed, heat turned on for an allotted period of time until that call is actualized. I declare someone's in the oven right now. And the only thing worse than waiting on God is wishing that you had. God has not forgotten about you while you're in the crock pot. God has not forgotten about you while you're in the oven. God has not forgotten about that child, about that marriage. He's up to something in your life. One more thing about Mary's call. And we'll rush. Here's what I want you to understand about her call. God's got a call in her life. And Mary helps us to understand what that call is. Look at verse 40, 54, 54. She says he has helped his servant Israel. What is she saying here? God's got a call on my life. My call is to birth the Messiah. And this Messiah is to help uh, Israel. Now, here's what I want to say to Mary. Mary, uh, kind of, sort of, yes. 
yes, but girl, you don't even know the half of it. This Messiah isn't just for Israel. This Messiah is for the world. In other words, God's call is always bigger than you can think. Mary, Jews are going to get saved, yes. Africans too, Germans too, Mexicans too, Cubans too. This child is going to die for the world. This call is bigger than what you could ever think. This is exactly Ephesians 3.20. Paul writes, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. You can't even begin to imagine what God wants to do in your life. You don't even have the mental capacity to be able to comprehend what God wants to do through your life. It's amazing. But secondly, though, Mary rejoices because God is working through your call. But secondly, Mary rejoices because God is working in spite of you. Now, if I were to stop right here, I I would say this is some pretty heady stuff. God wants to use me. There's a call of God on my life. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But please notice how Mary responds. Mary says in verse 48, for he has looked on the humble estate, the humble estate, the humble estate of his servant. That word humble estate, that phrase is one word in the original language, Greek. It simply means humiliation. Watch it out. It means to be brought low. What is Mary saying? Praise God for the call, but I didn't earn this. (laughs) I love it. Mary is channeling her inner Kendrick Lamar. Be humble. Here's Mary. She's from a podunk town called Nazareth. Gary, Pastor Gary shares with us the other week. Podunk town called Nazareth, of which it was said, can anything good come from Fresno? I mean, N- Nazareth. And <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me. Um, <laughs> Pastor Gary also pointed out, you know, Isaiah 53, it says of Jesus, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. I don't say this to be sexist. Uh, ladies, uh, Jesus was no Idris Elba. Uh, he was no The Rock. Uh, he was no Brad Pitt, whatever your cup of tea may be. If you'd have seen Jesus walking down the street, you wouldn't have stopped to take a double take. He was, at best, an average, ordinary-looking person. Now, if Jesus didn't have a biological, earthly dad, where did he get his average to below average looks from? It's a 12 to 14-year-old girl, average looks, podunk town called Nazareth. If we were casting for a reality show called The Messiah's Mama, We wouldn't pick her. Are are you getting this word today? See, See, Mary has the humility to see this call is surely God's grace, favor, and mercy. Now, here's my concern for you. Here's my concern for you. I'm, I'm looking at a room filled with very accomplished people, and I've talked to you. Some of you valedictorians in your class, salutatorians. Uh, others of you, you graduated summa cum laude and magna cum laude. And again, there's me. Thank you, laude. Y- you've just covered it all. <laughs> Very accomplished people. Your educational resume. I, mean, so, wh- wh- I think it was Wakuna telling me what she was working on for her Ph.D. I, I, I can't even pronounce what she's working on. This is some heady stuff. And you can get the nauseating narcissism to think that you got to where you got because of your intelligence. What do you have that you did not receive? But for the grace of God, you could have been born in Soweto in apartheid South Africa in the 1970s, given no shot. So stop acting like You've earned it all. What you have is the grace of God on your life, even if you are not a believer. (laughs) Mary's humble. Here's the normal arc of Scripture. Go home and read Psalm chapter 8, verse 2. The psalmist says, Out of the mouth of babies and infants... 
you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. You know, you know, you know, what, you know what they're saying there? The psalmist says, God, you delight in using weak, vulnerable, helpless things to accomplish your divine program on earth. And then Mary says in our text that, God, you actually scatter the proud. The, the writer of Proverbs says, God resists the proud. Now, the image I always get with that is, it's like me trying to play offensive tackle, and on the other side is Khalil Mack. Who's winning that one? So, 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 so the writer of Proverbs says, Brian, when you walk in pride and arrogance, you get in a three-point stance against God. Every time I'm in Atlanta's airport, e-concourse, I always stop to look at an ordinary plain gray suit in a glass case. Every time I'm in Atlanta's e-concourse, I always stop to look at an ordinary plain gray suit in a glass case. Now, two questions. Why am I looking at that suit? And secondly, why is that suit, ordinary plain gray suit in a glass case? Who would put that suit on display? I can tell you why that suit's on display. It ain't on display because of the fabric. It ain't on display because of who designed it. It's on display because if you read the little writing next to it, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wore that suit. What makes that ordinary plain gray suit so special is not the suit. It's who wore the suit. And likewise, Mary is saying, what makes me special is not me, but who wears me. And who wears me is God. And what makes you so special is not you, but who wears you. And it is God. For you are the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. God wears you. God wears you. God wears you. So here's Mary. Mary says, who am I? Who am I? Thirdly and finally, Mary helps us to see that God is working for far more than you. See, if I were to stop this message here, it, this is a, this is, you could leave saying this is kind of a grossly American message. That's all about you. All right? So God's going to call in my life. God's working in spite of me. I need to be humble about my call, my call, my call. But Mary, to be 12 to 14 years of age, she is so wise. Look at verses 54 to 55. She says, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. I got to hustle. What is Mary saying here? Uh, God's blessed me. There's a call of God on my life. I'm going to birth the Messiah. Now in verses 54 and 55, she threads it back to the broader program and plan of God that began in Abraham. Now write down Genesis chapter 12, because in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, this is the Abrahamic covenant where God comes to Abraham and he says, look, I'm going to bless those that bless you. I'm going to curse those that curse you. And through you, Abraham, the father of the Jews, the whole world will be blessed. In other words, I'm going to use the Jews as an instrument to bless the world. And the ultimate fulfillment of that is Jesus, who comes to earth as fully God, but also an ethnic Jew. So that Mary understands this child in my womb, it's not just about me. It's not just my call. This child is a part of a broader narrative of what God is doing in the world. Hear me. God is not ultimately concerned about you. I didn't think I'd get an amen on that one. God is not ultimately concerned about what happens in your house. But God wants to connect your life, your house, your plans to his broader program, his broader plan, his broader purposes in life. And Mary understands this. Let me explain it this way. My last name is Loretz. Uh, my last name is so unique that if anyone has it, they're directly related to me. You've heard me say before that that we can actually trace our family lineage back to my great-great-grandfather, Peter. Peter was a slave. 
who love Jesus, in my direct line, I'm embarrassed to say this, but in a good way, there's no such thing as a man who divorced his wife and no such thing as a man who didn't love Jesus. In my direct line, when I started driving and I would ask my dad for the keys to his Ford Aerostar, Burgundy, took that thing to the junior prom. It's another sermon for another time. Dad would toss me the keys to the car. You know what he would always say when he would toss me the keys to the car? Son, remember who you are. He tossed me the keys. I want to go out with, with a woman that night. I want to go out with my friends. Have fun, son, but remember who you are. What dad was saying is, tonight's not just about you, but you bear the last name Loritz. And with that name comes responsibility. May that thought be percolating in your mind and govern how you treat this woman tonight. May that thought percolate in your mind and govern the decisions you make tonight. You wear my name. Oh, friend, don't you understand? Peter says that you are a peculiar people. And you have a peculiar name, and your name in Christ is Christian, and you wear that name. And when you leave here, and when you go home, and when you go on that job, may you remember who you are. You belong to Jesus Christ. You have been bought with a price. You are no longer your own. You have been redeemed and have a future and a hope. May that govern how you spend money. May that govern how you navigate your job. Remember who you are. This is Mary. What does she do? She remembers this call. She connects it to the broader purposes of God. She's humble. And she begins by saying in our text as we close that my soul magnifies, magnifies, magnifies the Lord. When we remember who we are, we magnify God. Now, the idea of the word magnify it simply means to make bigger. But this, this kind of trips me out because you can't make God bigger. So what does it mean to make God bigger, to magnify the Lord? Well, we've all seen telescopes. You know what a telescope basically does? It brings faraway objects like planets into clear view. It doesn't make Mars bigger. It doesn't make uh, the moon bigger. It just bring it, brings it clearly into view. And when those things, those faraway places come clearly into view, what is the response? Awe. And wonder, don't you know your life is a divine telescope? You've been called by God to bring the faraway God into clear view through your life so that whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, it will all be done to the glory of God. This is what it means. There's a call on my life to bring God into clear view. And so as we close, what do we do while we wait? One, we remember that God has a call in our lives and that he's working through us. Two, we remember that God works in spite of us, so be humble. And three, God is working for far more than us. But still, what do we do while we, while we wait? Mary helps us. Because remember that the whole text is a song of rejoicing. Mary is rejoicing that God is on the move. That God is working. This baby is the one who will deliver Israel in the world. And when she finds this out, she stops everything. 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 And rejoices. Oh, this is a popular motif in the scriptures. When God moves and delivers his people, they stop everything. Everything. Everything and rejoice. After centuries of waiting on God while enslaved to Egypt, God finally shows up and miraculously rescues them by opening up the Red Sea and closing it in on the Egyptians. When they get to the other side of the Red Sea, Israel doesn't just continue with business as usual. No. They stop everything. Moses, in Exodus 15, he composes a song, and his sister Miriam breaks out her tambourine, and they rejoice because after waiting for so long, God shows up. 
When the prophetess, come here, Deborah, you testify. When the prophetess Deborah experienced a mighty working of God where they won the battle, she doesn't just sit by and twiddle her thumbs as if nothing happened. No. Israel breaks out in song and dance in Judges 5, rejoicing. And in 1 Samuel 2, after waiting for years to get pregnant and experiencing taunting by her rival, God finally opens up Hannah's womb and blesses her with a baby named Samuel. What does Hannah do? She doesn't give God a golf clap. No. In 1 Samuel 2, she stops everything. 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 And rejoices, oh, abundant life, don't you get it? When God shows up and you see him working, you need to stop everything, everything, everything and rejoice. When you've seen him work out the health crisis, you ought to rejoice. When you've seen him get you through school, you ought to rejoice. When the baby finally comes, you ought to rejoice. When the job finally comes, you ought to rejoice. When the breakthrough happens in the marriage, you ought to take a breakthrough and rejoice. Ah, But it's here (laughs) where Mary is rare. The baby hasn't come yet. The blessing hasn't arrived yet. Her Christmas hadn't happened yet. And yet she is rejoicing, watch an abundant life, before the blessing gets here. Even while she waits. So that Mary is rejoicing and praising God on credit. I wonder if there's anyone here so bold as to praise God this morning on credit while you wait. Will anyone praise God before the breakthrough? Will anyone praise God while unemployed? Will anyone praise God while you're waiting for that child to turn him around? Praise him. He's good. While you're waiting... God is working. Come on, Cormac and the team, we're done. God is up to something. God is moving. God's silence is not indifference. He's up to something in your life. There's a call on your life. He's moving in phenomenal ways. And when this baby comes, friends, this baby comes because there's a problem God saw. Our sin had gotten us in a jam. And I know it's not popular in 2018 to say hell and judgment and the wrath of God. But when I got ordained, I didn't get ordained to be popular. I took a vow to tell the truth, the whole truth. And nothing but the truth. The bad news is because of your sin, God's wrath is going to be poured out on you. You shall behold him face to face. And and if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you will spend an eternity separated from God. It pains me to even say those words. I shouldn't even say this stuff. This ain't the kind of stuff you grow a church off of. But I haven't been called ultimately to church growth. I've been called to declare the truth of God. Some of you are here today, and you don't know Jesus, and you're going to stiffen your neck when this, when this altar call is made. And need I remind you of the words of Mary, what she says about people who stiffen their neck and walk in pride, God will scatter them. So today, as you hear the word, don't harden your heart. God, the message of Christmas, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, who lived the life you could never have lived. You couldn't have lived a perfect life. You can't live a perfect day. But Jesus did it. And I deserve to die. But Jesus jumped on the cross in our place. This is the doctrine of the substitutionary atoning work of Jesus. He became the sacrificial lamb. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. I plead with you today, stop relying on your degrees, on your intellect. 
when you stand and meet God, your PhD will mean nothing. But Jesus will mean everything. Will you say yes to him today? So in just a few moments, we're going to open up the altar. I want to invite the elders to come. I want to invite the prayer team to come. Right now, would you just come? In just a few moments, we're going to open up the altar, but someone else is here today. And you know Jesus. You know Jesus. You know Jesus. But you are in a season of waiting. And this is a right now word for you. And you just want someone to pray with you in your season, in your season, in your season of waiting. It's tough. I know I've been there, and I will take a couple more tours of duty in God's crockpot. I know it. I know it. It's tough, but you're in the crockpot right now, and we want to encourage you. We want to pray with you. So, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we pray uh, a simple prayer as we close in the last two or three minutes together. Don't let anyone leave here without saying yes to you, without responding to you. I also believe, Lord God, that there's not only someone here today who needs to know Christ as Lord and Savior, but there's also someone here today, Lord Jesus, who they do know you, they're just, they're just tired and fatigued in their spirit because they're in a season of waiting and they need to be encouraged, Lord God. So would you strengthen the feeble knees as we close? Do it, Father God, we pray in Jesus' name.